So spoiler alert, the children are going to be looking at the fruits of the Spirit today. So I thought, what should I speak on today? Many times as adults, we like to think, well, we're going to talk about prophecy and all the important things in the Bible. Well, I got to thinking, perhaps the most important thing in the Bible for you and I to be considering are two things, the Beatitudes and the fruits of the Spirit as well. If you have your Bibles, turn over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Oftentimes when we look at the Beatitudes, which are listed at the very beginning of what's oftentimes referred to as the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus Christ gave, many people look at these Beatitudes and they look at them individually. And truly, we can study and should study these particular attributes that Jesus Christ lists of individuals that will be in the kingdom individually. But I want us to think of them today in a little different scope of window. And that scope is that of how they are actually all interrelated. And there is a unity within the Beatitudes as well as a unity with the fruits of the Spirit. Beginning in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus saw, that the, saw the crowds, he went up into the mountains, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and began to teach them. Notice that, the word teach associated with these Beatitudes. Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in heaven is great. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When we read those Beatitudes, there's some things that I think should jump out at us. One, do these attributes live within each one of us. If we are to be in the future and live in the future and live in the kingdom, we need to be the complete package. And this is the complete package. Notice you don't see a whole lot about prophecy in there. It's interesting when I look at this, there are nine specific Beatitudes listed. Now, some will argue with you. Novel idea, people arguing over scripture. Some will argue and say, no, there's really only eight because those last two are really go together. But are they really? I don't think so, because the last two, blessed are the people, are blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you falsely for all kinds of evil because of me. Not because of what you did, but because of me. And then Blessed are those who persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for doing the right things. There are two different things, doing the right things and because you are a Christian. So I, I submit to you and to myself, there's nine, not eight. And I don't think the two at the end go together like some argue that there are. But, you know, as you study more and more in the scripture, you begin to realize that the Apostle Paul, in many regards, is a modern day commentary on Jesus Christ's actual teaching. Have you ever thought about it like that? I know sometimes people like to look at the Apostle Paul's writings as standalones. The reality of the fact is when you really consider the epistles, letters, and everything that the Apostle Paul wrote, they are nothing more than expounding upon what Jesus Christ taught. And I submit to you and to myself that the Beatitudes as well as the fruits of the Spirit 
are an example of the Apostle Paul truly being a commentary regarding the teachings of what Jesus provided. Jesus taught and gave words, and the Apostle Paul's teaching in many cases are a expounding of that. If you'll turn over to Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul, when he was talking to the church at Galatia, obviously very familiar scriptures to us. When you think about the Beatitudes, in some regards, you can think about attributes that the Apostle Paul lays out relative to, again, the kingdom of God and what those are. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this and then go to another section where we start talking about the things that we should not be. But the things we should be are what's listed here in verses 22 through 23, which the children are focusing on today. But the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. And, you know, we oftentimes think of the what we see listed here as a lifetime accomplishment of development. But do you see when you list out these fruits of the Spirit, there's nine of them listed right here. Now, there is an argument that you can add a few more, but what I'm talking about is what's written right here. There's nine. There's nine Beatitudes from what we read as well. I submit to you and to myself, these fruits of the Spirit have connection to the Beatitudes. Something for us to consider about ourselves in this as well. And I don't think that the number nine in both of these cases of nine Beatitudes and nine qualities of the fruits of God's Spirit are just coincidence. In fact, I don't think very many things that we see in Scripture, for that matter, are just mere coincidence. You know, when you put the nine Beatitudes and the nine elements that, are, that constitute the fruits of God's Spirit side by side, there doesn't seem to be any real correspondence because, as we saw, the Beatitudes begin with blessed are, and it lists the different things. And here it is the fruits of the Spirit are, and it starts listing things. But remember, the Apostle Paul is a bit of a commentary, a bit of a commentator, if you want to say it that way. And he doesn't just simply repeat the Beatitudes. He's giving context to the Beatitudes that, the, that Jesus Christ wrote. And there's a little bit of difference in that, but it's the same thing. When you think about the things that we are not to have, here in the same chapter, Galatians 5, verse 19. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, disseminations, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, obviously, on the, on the tail end of, of this verse, he goes into what are the fruits of the Spirit. So there is a juxtaposition going on where you are viewing things you sh will not enter the kingdom of God with things that will enter the kingdom of God. And he is expounding upon the Beatitudes that Jesus referenced when he mentioned several times, blessed are, da-da-da-da-da, and shall inherit the kingdom of God. But you see listed here in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, specific things that outline elements, 15 in particular, that if they are a part of us, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. And sometimes, as humans, we all tend to define something by what it is not and so if you want to define the total package of a christian that will inherit the kingdom of god 
You can look at attributes that are not the things that will inherit the God to give you or kingdom of God that will give you an idea of what we should be. So you see that it, there's there's understanding that we can have both from the negative as well as the positive. So did the Apostle Paul just make up these 15 categories of things? Did he go on his own and say, well, you know what? I'm just going to tell you what you're if you do these things. You're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. It seems a bit odd that he would do that if he was expounding on the Beatitudes of Christ, that he would all of a sudden make a decision of who would not enter the kingdom of God. Let's turn over to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. I submit to you that the Apostle Paul was also, again, expounding upon what Jesus Christ had already stated. In Mark chapter 7, and we'll look in verse 21. Let's just, for the sake of context, go back to verse 20. Speaking of Jesus, he was saying, That which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceeds the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, Deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed in and defile, or rather proceed from within and defile the man. And you look at that particular list, and it comes up 13, a little bit short than the 15. But let's go over to Matthew chapter 15 to pick up a parallel of what Jesus is referencing here about what defiles a person. And certainly a person that's defiled will not be entering the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven or whatever you want to, to state in that regard. But in Matthew chapter 5, the same parallel of what was listed in Mark 7 we find in verse 15. Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And Jesus said, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the stomach passes into the stomach or pass into the mouth, passes into the stomach and then is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And those who those are the things that defile the man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. We see a bit of a parallel of several of the things that were listed in Mark 7, but as Bill will click on the next slide here, there's a couple of things for us to consider here. The first click, you'll see that their false witnesses is listed um, in Mark 7, but not in Matthew 15. The next click has to do with evil thoughts. It's interesting, Jesus uses two different words in Mark 7 and in Mark 15 regarding what gets translated into English as being evil thoughts. In Matthew, the word, as you see on the screen in Greek, is different than the word that you see that is in Mark. Yet in English and in most translations of the Bible, they both get translated to be the same thing for evil thoughts, but they're really not. They are extensions of one another, but they're not the same identical evil thoughts. And that's where if you add all of these together, Jesus is usually, is, is actually has 15, which corresponds to what uh, we saw earlier in Galatians 5 as the fruits of the flesh or the works of the flesh. But you look at the first word that is in uh, Mark, and that is kakos, and it frequently means evil, but it's referring to the absence of the quality of a person or something for which it claims to be. And as a result of being hypocritical, I guess, in that regard, from a moral sense, it's considered evil. That's what Jesus is referencing in Mark 7, when it when we get the English word evil thoughts. 
But in Matthew 15, the Greek word used there, panoris, or panoris, is more of a, a stronger and a more active term. It is specifically mischieving, acting, delighting in injury, doing evil to others, dangerous and destructive. So you see one is a bit of a character issue, something you claim to be, but you're not. And then the other is the actual deed. One's of the heart and one is of the deed. It's interesting because if you go to this next slide that I have and you lay down the, the comparisons between the Beatitudes and the fruits of the spirit, you'll see that the exact same words are not used every time. But you see unity between the two. And I submit to you that the same example that we're seeing in Mark 7 and Mark 15 with this evil thoughts and that extension of what's in the heart versus and the deception of that versus what an action is, is where we see an understanding that results in the, in the unity between the Beatitudes and the fruits of the Spirit for each one of us to consider. You know, you think about it. There's there's this whole list of, of beatitudes that we see that we've read earlier in Matthew 5. And there's the list of, of what is the actual, I guess, if you want to talk about it, what is produced from the beatitudes in the fruits of the Spirit. And Jesus makes a comment when he says, from within and out of the heart of a man proceeds evil thoughts. Jesus is talking about the heart, the attitude of the heart. Paul, when he's talking about the works of the flesh, he's talking about what results from those hearts or those deficiencies of the heart. We made a brief reference to this last Sabbath regarding producers and top producers and the habits of top producers. And in this regard, I think the unity, the, the complementary aspects of the Beatitudes and the fruits of the Spirit, we see one starts with a thought in the heart and one results in an action. Jesus is talking about the heart. What comes from within is what actually will ultimately defile the person. So the person will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The fruit or the work that is produced by the person with the wrong heart will not enter the kingdom of heaven, as we see in Galatians 5, in the form of what Paul is talking about. So we see that Paul, in many regards, is a commentator on what Jesus had already taught. And in fact, there's many examples of this throughout the writings, whether they were letters or whether they were um, uh, whether they were actual theological teachings, he is not making up new doctrine. He's not making up anything new about what Jesus taught. He is expounding upon what Jesus taught. Again, a clear understanding for us as we look through these examples and these comparisons that I have here on the screen, Jesus is talking about the inner attitude of the natural person Paul is talking about what happens when those evil thoughts become works and the works of the flesh. And so by the same corollary, we can say that if our heart has what's in the Beatitudes, then we can produce the fruits of the Spirit in the same manner that it works in the negative, as we've seen with what proceeds out of the heart that's evil, and the, and the works of the evil. The spirit, as we see here in the first one, the poor in spirit, you know, it will produce love. And, you know, you think about it from the perspective of even, let's talk about the analogy that the Apostle Paul uses. He uses the term fruit. And we talked about last week how many times in the Bible, an actual fruit or an actual plant is listed, but it's used in the format to represent an analogy towards a work. And when we talk about fruit, it's something that comes from a tree. And in this case, 
the example is the tree is a manifestation of the life of the individual. And it's something from the fruit that you can take it off the tree, but it doesn't affect the tree itself. Think about that for a moment. If you have a fruit tree at home, regardless of whatever the fruit is, and you pull a ripened fruit off the tree, it doesn't negatively affect the tree. In fact, in many cases, it'll make the tree produce more fruit. And that is the good side of the way you and I should be living our lives. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, is the first of the Beatitudes that's listed. And the first of the fruits of the Spirit of, of God is love. And when you think about that, that's pretty much a foundational aspect of, of um, the Beatitudes and what a Christian life is truly about, being poor in spirit. But how do the two relate to each other? Think about it. If you're not poor in spirit, then neither will you mourn for your sins. And neither will you hunger and thirst for righteousness. And neither will you be a part of God's kingdom. Without love, there's no point to talk about joy, peace, or patience. A faith that doesn't find any expression in love is dead and it's worthless. When you take a look at that first one, you know, it declares that the kingdom of God is given to those who acknowledge, as, and we'll just use the term spiritual bankruptcy before God. They're poor in spirit. They're bankrupt, spiritually speaking. That's how you're poor in spirit. So an individual that has this attitude, inside their mind, inside their heart, the exact opposite of vanity and, and arrogance. But the person that views themselves before God as spiritually bankrupt, that person can come to God with a sense of utter dependence, knowing that they deserve nothing but the judgment of God. Oftentimes, even in the churches of God, the individuals who think so highly of themselves and their arrogance, and there's a lot of arrogance in the churches of God, and hopefully there's less arrogance in us, and hopefully we are developing a more humble spirit, which is why we need to walk with God on a continual basis, doing justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly before him. We see that there's a dependency that we have towards God because we know that of and by ourselves, our, the judgment that would come down is not good. So we throw ourselves at the mercy of our heavenly father through Jesus Christ, our judge. And you know, you think about that. Do you know what God's will will do with that? What he will do with a person who has the right heart and they have this idea in their minds that they're spiritually bankrupt. They don't earn, they haven't earned anything other than the wrath of God through their sins. Will he not understand? Will he not accept that type of heart? Will he not then give his Holy Spirit to that particular person and show his love? I'll reference this, Romans 5, 5. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And when you think about that, the Holy Spirit that was given to us was the love of God because of a broken heart. A heart that realized that it was spiritually bankrupt. What happens to those who mourn over their sins? The second of the Beatitudes, who sees themselves in reality, not in a self-deception, how great thou art, but how lowly I am, and worries inside enough that it would result in a change. And when that change comes, does that person not feel joy from the morning? Because of the realization of the forgiveness that's been given through Jesus Christ's death and sacrifice, does it not result in a giving up of joy within the heart? Luke 6.21 says, Blessed are those who weep now, for they shall laugh. And it's interesting when you look at the parallel in Luke chapter 6, it's a parallel of the Beatitudes you see in Matthew 5. They're a little different order, and Luke uses a little different words. 
But that second beatitude, he makes the comment, he says, blessed are those who weep, not mourn, but weep, for they shall laugh. And the laugh is because of the joy that comes into their hearts, the innermost part. But it starts with the mourning. Looking at those who, through their own experience, you know, as opposed to thinking this in a, in a theological, academic way, what happens to the person who comes before God in meekness and humility with a contrite heart, as we know from Isaiah chapter 66? Will they not experience peace that only comes from God when God gives his spirit to that individual? And as a result of that, then they can go on living a way of life and produce a peace because they're humble and they are meek. And that spirit produces the peace in their actions. I'll reference this again as well. Matthew 11, verses 29 or 28 through 29. Jesus links his meekness and his peace with the well-known phrase that we've read of recent. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavily laden. I am meek and lowly in heart. Come to me and you will find rest. Rest. Rest comes from peace in your heart and your soul and a peace that comes over you as a result of understanding the great love that's been given to you and the joy of what now lays ahead of you through Jesus Christ and through the acceptance of that sacrifice. Think about the fourth beatitude that's listed. What happens when you hunger and thirst for righteousness? When you hunger and thirst for God, and notice that it's a present continual tense. It's not like you just do it one time and then you're done. No, it's a you're continuing to hunger and thirst for spiritual understanding. And then are you doing it just to accumulate a bunch of knowledge in your head so that you can get in an argument with somebody and shoot them down with scripture? Or are you doing it to reflect on yourself? And realize, again, utilizing these previous Beatitudes, looking inside yourself to see where you're falling short and you're less than what you should be. God will then, as a result of that, provide what we need, which is energy to endure the new life that Jesus Christ has set before us to live. And that results ultimately in what is referenced in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, where Paul makes the comment that all victory comes through Jesus Christ. It doesn't come through our works. It comes through Jesus Christ. And it gives us, as a result of continuing the hunger and thirst, it gives us the ability to endure, to have patience. And it's interesting, some translations look at that fruit that's listed as patience. Some look at it listed as long suffering. The word actually translated means consistency, perseverance, or steadfastness. So you can see it in both cases. If you're hungering and thirsting, if we are hungering and thirsting for righteousness and hungering and thirsting for God, then He will provide for us what we need to be consistent for the long haul, not the short term, the long haul. Because the long haul involves ongoing, continual hungering and thirsting, not just a one-time event. The sixth beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, corresponds with the fruit of the spirit of goodness. Goodness defined as, as a part of that Greek word that's in Galatians 5 is uprightness of heart and life. So if you have a pure heart, then you can live an uprightness of the heart of your way of life. A pure heart, when you think about it, is a pure conscience, a good conscience. And there's a connection between pure and good. And, you know, you think about that, even regarding things such as precious metals, gold, silver. There is a purity associated with that, and there's a value associated with that because there's goodness associated with that. Spiritually speaking, from a pure heart, we can have a good conscience. And that comes from 1 Timothy, verses 1 through 5, where it says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. 
That's what the Apostle Paul is referencing to Timothy. And that is how we should keep the commandments of God. From a pure heart, with a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And that will produce an uprightness of our heart and in our life, which is that spirit or fruit, or should say fruit of that spirit, which is goodness. The seventh, blessed are the peacemakers, corresponds with the fruit of the spirit of faithfulness. Peacemaker is someone who can be described as faithful because that person is one who's walking faithfully in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. You now you think about the Apostle Peter making reference to that, and the Apostle Paul makes reference to it as well. And think about this. Why did Jesus Christ take up the stake or the cross, whichever word you want to use there? Was it not for him to be the peacemaker to reconcile us to him and to the Father? Reconciliation is what peacemaking is all about. I will never forget years ago um, hearing a conversation between a person in the church, and they made the comment about, well, and, and my mother-in-law at the time said, well, aren't we supposed to be peacemakers? And they said, well, a peacemaker just gets shot in a line of fire. And I'm like, mm, I'm thinking we missed the point there, what being a peacemaker is all about. We need to be a peacemaker for reconciliation purposes. 2 Corinthians 5.8 says, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So if we get reconciled to Christ, through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, and then we should be able to have a way about us for which we can help reconcile ourselves to people, not be enemies, not be the person that gets caught in the crossfire, but the person who's seeking reconciliation with people. Kind of reminds you of the Apostle Paul making reference to, to those who are without the law, I became as one without the law to those with the law became as one with the law and his whole purpose as he says was for salvation and i'll come to that in the next message because i think sometimes in the churches of god they've fallen prey to what the witness things in the evangelism of protestantism and it gets infiltrated into the churches of god and that's a wrong thought but the reconciliation is a part of what we are to be and a part of what our mission is with the right heart of being a peacemaker but we can't be faithful and we can't follow in the steps of jesus christ if we don't have a heart that is seeking peace with others the eighth beatitude blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake and then you see the corresponding spirit of gentleness associated with that we certainly don't want to be persecuted for the sake of our unrighteousness we don't want to be persecuted, and the Apostle Peter even makes reference to this about how, you know, you do not want to suffer as a result of your sins. You want to suffer as a result of people persecuting you because of your righteous acts. And, you know, you think about that. You know, a Christian is, how, they're, how are we supposed to respond when persecution for righteousness comes? Are we to shoot back and argue with people? I know I've gotten in that argument situation before and then it hit me with a family member and i thought god help me out of this because i have really sinned i have let my emotions get the best of me and i have been a part now of all of this and this is wrong and sometimes it may result in us being able to back out of a situation and be able to not have to have that that come up again some cases we may have to do that, but we definitely don't shoot back. We don't revile back. We don't become aggressive to the aggressor. What was Jesus's attitude? He, he didn't answer in some cases. And we know that from Isaiah 53. But in 1 Peter 2, 23, it says, when he, Jesus, was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten. He was gentle. Oftentimes, we want to threaten people who threaten us. And many of our attitudes come from our personalities, and some personalities are aggressive. I can see that just my interaction with some of you. Some of you are aggressive type personalities, and some are not. Some are the passive aggressive of personalities. We have to mind, be mindful of ourselves and pray for help in all of these things, but we must be gentle, just like Jesus Christ was gentle. And then finally, the ninth beatitude, which is similar to the eighth, 
But it's the second part that's a little different. It's not for righteousness sake, but blessed are those who are who are suffer because of evil falsely against you for my sake, Jesus says. And that means the spirit of self-control. And we do have to control ourselves. When people are telling false stories about us, and if you haven't had that happen at one time in your life, if you live a little bit longer, I'm sure it's going to come up. And somebody's going to impugn your reput reputation in some form or, or matter. Sometimes we give them good reason and sometimes we don't. Hopefully we have more of the situations where we don't give them good reason. And this is what Jesus is talking about in this beatitude. People will spread lies about you. I know I've had many things said about me that were not true. We need to have self-control and not, in the same fashion we saw earlier, start spitting back threats back to the individuals. We can't lose our temper. You know, when you think about each one of these that we've seen, there's a clear connection between the Beatitudes, in my mind, and the fruits of the Spirit. And there's a unity associated with them. And there's a nature of this that's spiritual in nature. And it starts with the inner attitude of the heart that Jesus is accentuating with the Beatitudes, that then through the life of the individual Christian results in fruit. Produce, production. What do we produce? Are we producing the fruits of the Spirit? Or are we nothing more than academic theologians who can spout Scripture, but then don't produce these fruits? That's something for you to ask about yourself and for me to ask about myself. These things are very important. And the Beatitudes talk again about the inner attitudes. Fruits of the Spirit talk about what is produced from those attitudes. So I hope this will help us to focus on our minds or on the right areas of life or where we need to be focused. And a couple of questions before we get into the next message that I'll pose to you based on what we've seen. Which comes first in the life of the Christian? The Beatitudes or the fruits of the Spirit?